Discipline, diversification and discovery might be the three terms you'd apply to our guest and his firm today, an organisation that has an explicit culture of exploring economics, data, statistics and technology in order to improve their understanding of what drives markets and how it can be applied to client portfolios. In a world of competing approaches to investing, such a systematic approach to constructing and managing portfolios isn't for everyone, but the firm's reputation and execution and its admirers have earned it a seat at the top table of global managers. So today, from Connecticut, it's a great pleasure to welcome Cliff Asnes, co-founder and CIO of AQR, Applied Quantitative Research. Cliff, welcome to the Money Maze podcast. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Great. Well, I have, of course, studied you, which gives me an an early advantage. Um, And I read that you were an underachiever at school. You're a happy-go-lucky child. You were a wise ass and a class clown. Now, when did all that change? Well, somehow I have preserved the class clown part, I think. Um, But (laughs) there is a lot of truth to the story. We're going back to high school now. Um, In high school, I was kind of the student where the teachers, whenever they'd have a conference with my parents, would say, we think he has so much potential, uh, but he's just not living up to it. I I went to a perfectly good public high school on Long Island, um, but it wasn't quite like today, where if you were at all talented, they did a great job of finding you and whatnot. It was more just uh, once a year disappointing uh, parental conference. Um, I had a lot of fun in high school, nothing too weird. Uh, but uh, I was uh, happy-go-lucky, maybe extreme, but I, I, I was type B for the last time in my life. Um, I got into college solely because of standardized tests. When I got to college, I, I enrolled in this dual degree program. It was uh, business and engineering at UPenn. Um, I enrolled in it solely on my father's advice. He said, you are aimless and have no idea what you want to do. But, but you seem to be good at maths. I'm saying maths now for your benefit. I'm adding the S. I'm a bit of a chameleon that way. Um, you, you're good at maths. So study two things and figure it out later. That was the entire plan. I got into school on, on, on testing. I did have a panic moment, uh, more than a moment, a few months when I showed up at college. And I, I was kind of like the kid who kept telling my parents and anyone else involved, when it really counts, I'll work. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it up. And then I got there, and, and maybe for one of the few times in my life, I really um, felt lost because I was like, I've been telling people I'll turn it up for years. A, can I? And if I do, will it be successful? And I will say I went through kind of a three-month transition to extremely type A, um, a you know, driven, a little crazy about work, and have never looked back. It's very odd. I I admit I had kind of a road to Damascus moment um, and never looked back. I'm still hoping one day if I I ever retire and spend time with my wife, I can turn it back. Um, That that remains entirely unclear. So I'm intrigued because you're obviously very quantitative. You evaluate the data a lot. You go to study um, after uh, Wharton, you go to study at the University of Chicago. And I got the impression that you were recommended it and you got on a plane and you went there and it was a decision not, not, not deeply founded in analysis. <laughs> I think that's directionally right. I, I think I, w- I was a little less irresponsible on this one than, than, than that sounds like. What I did, uh, I, I decided I wanted to get a PhD because I got a part-time job uh, just for the money. Uh, coding up uh, various tests for a few Wharton professors. So I, you know, I was the one who was running um, the, the the data and the pa- and the tables for their papers, and I just thought it was cool. Um, I, I I enjoyed the stuff. I, I, en- I you know I got a glimpse into the process. I was not. I was just the coder. I was not uh, asked for the, my advice on 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 their research, but I got a real glimpse into the process. And I really did have a moment where I was like, this is cool. It's the same stuff um, studying in business school, taken to another level. Um, and, it, you know, and I just enjoyed the intellectual side. And I went to these professors, of one of which I should mention is Andy Lowe, quite a famous academic professor. Uh, academic professor is redundant. Uh, quite a famous uh, MIT professor. 
Um, I knew him when he was just Andy Lowe. Uh, he was effectively a kid. Um, I always find it funny that he wrote one of my recommendations to, 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 to grad school and, and then became very justifiably famous. I decided that's what I want to do. I then, I actually think for me, this was diligent. I went to probably about 10 Wharton professors, all of who have PhDs in finance. That's kind of the, the, the table stakes for being a Wharton professor and said, you know, if you were me, where would you go? And I do not want to knock Wharton. They were very nice to me. I had a great experience, but PhD programs, I was naive. I just assumed they line up with undergrad and grad school rankings. So if you are the top graduate program for an MBA, you're probably the top PhD program. And they're just very different. Um, in some schools, they, they're, 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 they're very similar, but in some schools, and at that point, and I, I, I don't know about today, I've not kept up on it, Wharton's PhD program was not nearly up to their MBA and their undergrad business work. So I expected all these professors to go, oh, you stay at Wharton if you want a PhD. And I was very comfortable with that. I, 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 liked, I, I liked Philadelphia, which sounds odd in retrospect. Nine of them said go to the University of Chicago. One said go to Stanford. A guy named uh, uh, Bob Litzenberger, very famous, uh, uh, wonderful academic, uh, and an ex-Stanford professor. Um, the way it broke down back then a little bit was uh, both both were good at both, but Chicago was known as more the empirical school where you're going to really get your get into the data. Stanford was known as more of the theoretical school where it was more uh, mathematical models. Um, and, and that's an exaggeration. You could be great at either at either, but that was the split. But a big part of why I ended up choosing Chicago, uh, and this is a little embarrassingly shallow, is Stanford did not offer to fly me out and visit. PhD students get treated much nicer um, than than other students. You get a stipend. Uh, they want you to come mainly because you kind of be kind of be the professor's slave for a few years. So it's it's not all it's it's, it's not all altruism, uh, but economically they get a deal. Um, Chicago had it in its budget, and they said, "Hey, we'll send you a ticket. Do you want to fly out?" And I think this was like my third time in my life on an aeroplane, which is didn't travel a lot as a kid. I had no money uh, at the time. So I visited Chicago and not Stanford. I visited Chicago on the most gorgeous spring day you could imagine. And I hope I'm not really this stupid, but the way I remember the story is I chose Chicago over Stanford on the weather, which may have been... The worst bait and switch I fell for. I mean, it worked out, uh, it, but it may have been the worst bait and switch I fell for. But, you know, life is highly, as the quant geeks will say, path dependent. Um, I, you know, hopefully I would have had a good experience there, too. Uh, but I was probably this close to going to Stanford if they uh, if they said, we'll send you a coach ticket to to to, to San Francisco. Got it. So you, of course, get to study under um, one of the great Nobel laureates, Eugene Farmer. And I wonder just at high level, because we're going to get into the markets in a minute. But he said, I read, he said in one of your early lectures that markets are not always efficient. And for a wide global audience of, of varying levels of experience in markets, what did you understand that to mean? He did say that. Uh, and it's, it always, for people who do follow this stuff, but not super closely, it often shocks them because he is the God, he basically won the Nobel Prize for the efficient market hypothesis. The efficient market hypothesis says prices reflect all information. There is a technical problem I'll only spend a second on called the dual hypothesis problem, where you do have to think about how they're supposed to reflect that information. You need a model for what is rational incorporation of information. Um, and that that is actually still an issue in in studying finance. Uh, but just take the idea, the intuitive idea of efficient markets. I think everyone gets that markets are pretty good at processing all that out there. And there aren't giant mispricings. And again, if you really want to get geeky, you have to talk about what is a mispricing. But let, let's just keep it intuitive. So markets incorporate all information uh, and prices are accurate, given that information. Like the third week of class, Gene, and I took the class three times effectively. 
I didn't. I, I that sounds like I failed it twice. I, I actually took it, and then I was the teaching assistant for two years. And I was so nervous at that point about doing a good job that I sat through every class three times. So um, maybe some of his other TAs have done the same, but I have to be tied for the one who's taken Gene's class the most. And it's about the third week every year. He looks at the class after introducing the market, uh, the efficient market hypothesis and says, just to be clear, markets are almost assuredly not perfectly efficient. And I don't know if it's a literal gasp, but you can feel the room go like, wow, I can't believe he said that. Anywhere else in the world, you don't get a gasp. University of Chicago and Gene's class, you get a gasp. Anywhere else in the financial world, they go, yeah, we know markets aren't perfect. Um, anywhere else outside of our world, and you get the, what the hell are you talking about to begin with? Um, so th this is an odd place in the world where, where that's a gasp. And he, he, Gene is, a, he's still um, one of my major heroes. He's an intellectual giant, but he's also intellectually honest. Um, he thinks markets are, I'll put words in his mouth, fairly close to efficient. He thinks they've passed most of the tests. Um, he thinks they're more efficient than I do these days. But perfect efficiency is a very extreme hypothesis. He, he says, of course, they're not perfect. Um, and I would say, once you open the door. Now you're arguing. Now, now the argument is how efficient are they? And, ha and a subset of that is, does that change through time? Um, so I think it's, it, that's how I understood the whole thing. Uh, but it gets really interesting when you start drilling into it. Uh, literally nobody in the world uh, believes in perfect market efficiency. Um, we all, uh, you know, uh, gray area arguments are harder. But we're all arguing about where amongst the goalposts they are. So I think that whilst that is a term that is used more, more in academic and theoretical circles, momentum is used every day and misused in many ways. And you decide to write a paper on price momentum. And I guess just uh, because it's going to help later on when we talk about what's what's going on with markets today, why would you pluck a, a concept like that and decide it needed to be worked on? Let me give you some insight into a third year PhD student in a panic over coming up with a dissertation topic. Why would you pluck something <laughs> is 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 not the question. The question is is are you desperate to find something interesting? And I have to say, um, we try to uh, avoid what's called data mining. That's just looking for patterns in the data with absolutely no theory. Some of that maybe we'll get into this has changed with machine learning where Data mining is maybe a little more appropriate when you have a ton of data and some new tools, but certainly in the days of linear regression, um, there's a great danger to just testing everything and seeing what works because a lot of things just work randomly and will it work going forward? And I, I, I have to admit, you've gotten this out of me, Simon. I usually, I usually don't admit this one. Um, I think my initial work was probably just a PhD student hacking around the data um, and data mining. Um, it turned out that uh, when you find a result, there are two things you really want to see if some result isn't just random. You find uh, that that uh, CEOs with first initials that begin with a vowel, companies do better. Two things. A, do you have any theory that's plausible? Not a theory, and you can smell this when it happens, that you tortured to fit the result. But do you have any theory that could say why this this, this should be true. And that one pretty clearly, I think, fails on that front. The other thing you look for are what are called out-of-sample tests. Those are, is there data available to run essentially the same tests that you have not looked at yet? And one cure for data mining is, well, if it's real, it shouldn't just work in the one place you looked. So I ran these tests from 1963 to 1990. These things stick in your head forever. Um, one of the one of the cooler things. This is just a I feel old story, but I now have more out of sample data since my dissertation than I had starting in sample data. Real life has been longer than the period I I study. That just means I'm old. Um, so we found I found this result initially from sixty three to the to ninety that the last twelve months of price return tend to predict the next months price return. 
it's far or total return or price. It doesn't matter. It's far from perfect. It's a trading strategy with uh, what we would call a decent risk adjusted return. Well above what it should have if there was no predictive power. But not a lot of theory. And today we do have theories. Um, uh, the, the main one people uh, have, or the main one I think is going on is what's called underreaction. When new news comes out, the prices move, but there's a psychological phenomenon called anchoring and adjustment. They don't move all the way. Um, so there's still some juice left just by observing price moves. But clearly that's also what's called an expo story. I didn't start with that story and test it. Um, so the best thing to do is add a sample test. And uh, most people in their life don't have the out of sample tests that change their life. Uh, but I, I realized Fahm and French had used the 63 to call it late eighties, uh, 90 period to test their initial work on value and size. And that's what they had been studying at the time. And I had copied that because I was their PhD student. So I copied them. And I suddenly realized that at that point, they didn't have the data to test value in particular prior to 63. They didn't, you know, price to book was the, the simple basic measure they used for value back then. Um, and the data started in July of 63. Since then, people have scribbled and sent scribes to the, to the archives, and we have that data back much further. But at that point, that's all we had. And it just, you know, this was um, major, it, kind of a simple epiphany. I'm not super proud of it, but it was an epiphany moment for me where I said, wait, what I'm studying is just price. We do have that data back much more. And then I ran the same test from 26 to 63 and got essentially the exact same results. And that I had a little bit of a moment of, oh, wow, that was, that was cool. Um, later on, not initially in my dissertation, we also tested all of that internationally, which is another beautiful out of sample test. Uh, you, I'm sure you've never found this, but we in the U.S. may occasionally think we're the entire world. If something works in the U.S. for psychological behavioral reasons that make markets not terrible but imperfect, you got to really tell a very twisted story why it's only in the U.S. If it doesn't work anywhere else, I think you have to back up and go, I really might have just gotten lucky here. Um, and eventually it did pass those tests, but I'm, 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 I'm more forward in the story. Um, so I went to uh, Gene Fah. I should say, too, I'm making it sound like I discovered momentum. Uh, two professors, Jagadish and Tipman, uh, are generally acknowledged, including by me, as the pioneers of momentum. I'm still a little bitter because I think I was discovering it at about the exact same time as them. Uh, and they were professors and I was a PhD student. So, But it's completely fair. They were, they were slightly ahead of me and, 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 and get the right of, of, of uh, get the, the accolades for finding it. But I had to go into Gene Fama's office. And this was, act I was actually scared. I'm embarrassed to tell you things I was scared about because it's like, why would you be scared of this? But, you know, you're early 20s and you're going to Gene Fama's office to tell him you want to write a dissertation on the fact that buying what's going up and selling what's going down seems to be a really good strategy. That does not scream efficient markets. Again, efficient markets are a subtler definition. You can try to shoehorn it in, but it's, it's not. Um, and I remember telling Gene, I want to write a dissertation that at least is partially, it actually wasn't all on this, but at least partially is testing the price momentum strategy. And then I'm pretty sure I mumbled the second part. The second part was, and it works really well. And Gene was like, well, what was that, uh, Cliff? And I'm like, um, it uh, it, momentum works really well. And I thought he might be very dismissive of it. I, I should have respected him more. He was incredibly intellectually honest. His exact words to me, um, because they, they felt like a religious statement, were, if it's in the data, write the paper. The man respects data like you can't believe. So he might not like that momentum. I'm sure he doesn't like that momentum works. He's called it the, um, he and Ken French have repeatedly called it the largest embarrassment to their three and later five factor models. Um, but he was very good about it and very supportive. Um, so I don't exactly remember your question that started to my long diatribe on, on momentum, uh, but that's how I got there. Again, it was only part of my dissertation. It's only a part of what AQR does. Um, but, it, it, you know, finding it, finding it was, you know, 
also part of the reason I think, no, Gene said this initially, but one of the reasons it went over so well with him was I wasn't stupid enough to say do this instead of value. Um, That would have been bad investing because they work very well together. Um, They both on average work, but they work at very different times. In geek speak, they're negatively correlated. Simon, if you're a value investor and I'm a price momentum investor, a good year for you is often not a good year for me and vice versa. But on average, we both make money. And that's one of the holy grails of investing, be you a quant or not a quant. Finding things that on average work, but don't work at the same time or even better work at different times. Um, so I, yeah. so that would have been bad investing to say, do this instead of value. It also would have been terrible graduation strategy. Um, you, you know, t- telling your professors do this instead of your stuff. Um, so everything was copacetic. They were very happy with it. Um, and my fears were, were not realized. So for those who aren't familiar, you are credited with having written this paper with enough empirical evidence so it does become integrated into mainstream academic literature, so that's great. But just when you could have been a top professor joining them, Goldman Sachs come calling, just tell us what was what really was the lure? There were a few stages to this. Um, I had two friends. Um, one was still my best friend who's uh, on my freshman hall uh, in college. Um, and a Wharton professor that I knew well were at Goldman Sachs Asset Management kind of restarting their fixed income effort. Uh, They had some some phenomenal people, legends, um, uh, guys named Bill Marshall and Jess Yowitz who were running it. Um, And and they had left to go do something else. And these guys were kind of super talented people charged with restarting it. Um, And at some point, they asked me, why don't you come for the summer and see if you like it? So I came for the summer. Um, Then after, I think, a fairly successful summer, they said, why don't you come for a year? Work on your dissertation part of the time and and participate in what we're building here. Um, And, you know, they they teach you at at Chicago and uh, that an option can only be worth zero. Um, So it did strike me as I I still thought I was going to be a professor, but it struck me as real world experience would be good even as a professor. And why not try it? Um, so I went, I was supposed to uh, do analytics, as you would imagine, as, a, as their visiting PhD candidate, um, very quickly, because they were building a business rapidly. Um, I was a warm and at least semi-competent body. So I was on the phones trading. And, and uh, uh, that was a different experience than I expected. Really good to have done once in your life. I'm not born to be a on-the-phone trader, but understanding over-the-counter markets and Um, getting lied to by people and maybe not lying, but not revealing his little poker to it. Um, There there was a very interesting, it it stood me in good stead to have done that for a while. So at the end of this year, I am on the fence between Goldman Sachs. I'm writing my dissertation at night still. This was probably the busiest I've ever been in my life, working Goldman Sachs hours during the day on fixed income and writing a dissertation on what we would now call, we didn't call it then, what we would now call quant equity at night was it was a weird life. Thank God I was in my 20s. I, I could not do that today. As a total personal aside, um, years later, my wife and I, um, mainly her, had four children in a year and a half. We had two sets of twins born a year and a half apart when I was at AQR. And I often describe this as kind of the other time in my life that I was working all day and up all night. Um, it was simply a different nocturnal activity. Feeding children is not quite the same as banging out a dissertation, but two kind of crazy periods in my life. So I'm getting closer on this dissertation. Um, Gene, um, I only now, it's like uh, only in the last five years am I comfortable calling him Gene, by the way. He's told me to do that since 1990 uh, when I left. Uh, he's always been professor to me. I'm finally acclimating uh, to this. Uh, Gene and Ken French, were frankly, in a very nice, complimentary way, putting pressure on me to go on the academic job market. And then I just think I got very lucky. And anyone who, who's happy where, where their life turns out, particularly if you're an order statistic on some front, if you don't admit you had a lot of luck along the way, you're, you're just not telling the truth. You're, you're, you're an egomaniac. And I may be an egomaniac, but not on this front. Um, Goldman was looking to start a quant group. 
there's an even funny sub part of the story. You know why they were looking to start a quant group? Largely because of the then success of long-term capital. Uh, yes, of course. A bunch of academics who were on Wall Street making a ton of money. And uh, Goldman was not alone. Uh, other firms were saying, we need some guys like that. Um, I don't think what we do, and I don't want to criticize the long-term capital guys. They were brilliant guys. Thankfully for us, because it did have its problems, we didn't do very similar things to them, but they were not that discerning. The idea was, we need an academic group. And I, I, at some point, another piece of luck, uh, PIMCO uh, read my first published paper in the Journal of Portfolio Management. I wrote a paper uh, with the exciting, head-turning, coming to Netflix soon title, Option Adjusted Spreads and a Steep Yield Curve. Um, Simon, you can try out. Maybe you can be an extra in this movie. <laughs> they liked the paper. They talked to me and they said, why don't you come start a quant group here? So suddenly everyone wanted me to start a quant group. I ended up deciding to stay at Goldman Sachs and do it. Um, again, I think I was this close to living in nice weather out of Newport Beach. And once again, I managed to maneuver my life not to get to live on the beach, which, you know, one day maybe I'll, I'll get that chance, but I've missed my two major ones. Um, told my professors the honest truth. I think I get to do and study the same academic stuff I'd be studying uh, as a professor, um, I get to see if it works for real, which is very exciting. And to be brutally honest, I get paid a Goldman Sachs salary um, to do it with all the upside that that, that can come with. And uh, anyone, particularly someone educated in finance who tells you they chose Goldman Sachs over academia, but money had nothing to do with it, is probably also not telling you the truth. If luck had nothing to do with it, they're not telling the truth. And anyone who chooses a career as a quantitative money manager who says it, it, it had nothing to do with it. I, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to be a poet, but I, I found this even, even more exciting. Also probably not telling the truth. Um, so I, I started there and it, you know, the rest is history, uh, history with some big ups and downs, I might say. Uh, but we started a quant group. Uh, initially, it was a, a, a group um, it, with very little mandate. They just knew they wanted a quant group. They didn't know what a quant group should do. And neither did I. So we were kind of door-to-door quants. We went all around GSAM saying, you guys need any help with anything? So you, you create this systematic investing group. It has great success. It goes up from 10 million, 100 million. It's open to the public. But we're going to talk as this leads into your decision to lead to go to AQR. But before we talk about AQR, in its very essence, define systematic investing. Systematic investing, it, it, it's, it's rules-based. It's looking at uh, historical data, hopefully with some theory behind it. Um, it, 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 though, again, with the m- world of machine learning and big data, um, we are uh, moving slightly away from that over time. But it's looking at historical data with some overriding investment principles, testing them. And then what makes it systematic is two things. Um, sticking to it and diversification. Sticking to it, I, I don't. I don't mean the. It's doing horrible. We have to batten down the hatches. That's an issue too. We could talk about, but I don't think if you can call something a systematic investment process if every day you're coming in looking at what it recommends, and and making uh, and changing half the trades. So systematic, almost almost by definition, means almost all the time. There can be exceptions. There can be risk breaks. There can be. You can have you. You can think maybe the data is bad, and we have to go check it. Um, but almost all the time, you are following what your model says in the short term. Long term, you can change your model if you if you think it should be. But each given day, a systematic investor doesn't come in and go, "What do I think of Tesla?" No. The second yeah. one is diversification. Uh, quants uh, versus the very talented traditional stock pickers. Um, have some pluses and some minuses. Um, traditional stock pickers get to know a lot more about any one situation than we can ever know. We get to bet on a lot of situations. A, a concentrated stock quant manager, to me, is almost a, a contradiction in terms. 
Um, I'm sure someone out there is going to say I run a great con- concentrated quant shop, and they may in some way I don't understand. But in general, quantitative systematic investing is almost always a small edge that you want to apply in many, many places. So long-winded answer, I'm sorry, but systematic is largely based on historical data, hopefully with theory, that you pursue with diversification. And with perilously few exceptions, that day you follow your model. You're not sitting there saying, how do I feel about this? Got it. So you leave to set up AQR, Applied Quantitative Research, I think. And I'd like just to recap. I think you're managing about $100 billion today. Uh, just give us uh, the highlights for where you are and, and, and the essence of your firm. We started out running a billion dollars. Um, this was very exciting to us at the time. I think, uh, I think we were at that point the largest standing start for a hedge fund to date. Um, it's been eclipsed many times since then. Uh, it's like having a sports record. Um, the younger, stronger athletes come in and eclipse your, your, your records. Um, when we were at Goldman Sachs, we ran all kinds of portfolios. We ran very traditional um, portfolios where you have a benchmark, say, of global equities. Um, you can't do any of the hedge fund type stuff. You can't short. You can't lever. Um, you can't use derivatives in many of them. And you just use your models. Um, again, back then, they were largely value and momentum, and they've tremendously evolved since then. But to buy things you think are better than the index and sell things you think are worse, but in a very traditional format. We also ran quite aggressive in some cases, hedge fund versions. These are less different than they sound. They sound radically different, but to be oversimplistic, if in a traditional portfolio, you overweight stock A and underweight stock B based on your model, in a market neutral hedge portfolio, you long stock A and you short stock B at some ratio you think is, is very, is very hedged. Um, so it, we were known for a bunch of things, and we had a good run in, in everything, but the premier product back then was something called Global Alpha, which was a very aggressive, too aggressive, I would, I would look back now, certainly career-wise too aggressive. Um, we, were, we were targeting uh, volatility. Volatility is not a perfect measure of risk. It's just um, one, one gear, one metric. We were targeting volatility that was probably 50% more than the equity market's volatility. Uh, and you know, you may notice the equity market tends to move around a bit. Um, we were targeting that in a market neutral way though. So we should move around a lot. We should have huge up days, huge down days, but they should on average make money. That's pretty important. And be unrelated to the direction of the stock market. And that makes high volatility in theory much more tolerable because it's diversifying. In fact, I can tell you it's not always so tolerable when you have your bad periods. Uh, but so we started this. Um, when we left to start AQR, we envisioned starting a firm much more like what we are today, where we do some products like the aggressive hedged product at Goldman, but some that are far more traditional. Again, the same models can be used for both. Um, we believe in both businesses. We think there's value added to both. We discovered pretty quickly at AQR that you couldn't launch a traditional business as a bunch of, uh, I think I was the old man at 30. Um, people would look and go, well, we want a five-year track record, and we prefer managers who look like Cliff looks today at 57, not like I looked at 30. We prefer some grizzle on our managers. But ironically, to start a super aggressive levered shorting derivatives based or derivatives using, not based, hedge fund, you had to tell them we did really well at Goldman Sachs and we're closing. And they lined up to invest. So I always found it a little ironic that the you had to be a mature adult to run the safe, boring version, but you had to be 30 years old and closing to run the super aggressive hedge fund. So we initially launched with only a product that we rebuilt it from scratch and, and from public stuff that we had written, but was essentially a version of global alpha 
And over time, we've grown our firm. We are not a $100 billion hedge fund. Um, I, I always tell people that for various reasons. One, I, I, you know, I've, I'm not complaining. I've done quite well, but not as well as someone who runs a $100 billion hedge fund. We do not charge for mo- the bulk of the assets hedge fund fees. When you run beat the benchmark by a few percent a year, uh, traditional portfolios, you, you got to charge 20 basis points, not two and 20. Um, so they're very different businesses. But today we run a little bit north of $100 billion. Uh, we ran a fair amount more than that before 2018 when we had a very bad kind of two and a half year streak. This business, um, even if you're right long term, is very cyclical. So I've, I've seen both sides of this. Uh, but certainly, I'm, I'm, you know, if you showed me the 25 year path and we're, we're on our 26th year now, um, if you showed me that path when we launched AQR in 1998, um, there, there are years I'd like to skip, but I would sign for the whole path in a heartbeat. So I want to shine the spotlight on the markets today. One of the places I want to start, and you alluded earlier on to the international versus domestic, uh, it, you know, has been this you know, enormous bifurcation between the U.S.'s performance of late versus international. In fact, Larry Siegel, who I believe is a good friend of yours, yes, and communicates yes. with uh, communicates with Barkley Douglas, who's a friend of ours at the Money Based Podcast, said, uh, this is his question. He said, why have international stocks performed so poorly for so long? Should I throw away the book I partially ghost wrote with Roger Ibbotson about global investing? <laughs> going to guess I agree with Larry that he should not throw away that book. Um, we will, uh, let me first back up and go in our, in our active portfolios, we'll make very small bets on something like this. We, we, again, as quants, we try to do many, many things. Um, and it's not just a value based value based strategies have liked outside the U S for time immemorial because the U S has traded expensive quality and momentum based strategies have often liked the U S. So for a diversified quant, in an active portfolio, it's not always clear that you've just, you know, been short the U.S. forever. But I have, like Larry, been a public fan of global diversification. And for a U.S. investor, that's been a pretty bad decision. You were too kind when you said recently. Um, for about 30 years, it's been a, 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 a bad decision to diversify outside the U.S. Now, I have, as you can imagine, a bunch of retorts to this to to this argument the first and no one likes to hear this this is this is depressing you run the math 30 years is beyond an eternity in a career three years is an eternity to be wrong in a career it's not that long a time statistically statistically you don't sit there and go we've proven the u.s is always better um Giant single bets like U.S. against non-U.S. are glacial in how long they take to to get enough data to really feel comfortable with. Second, and I wrote a piece on this called The Long Run is Lying to You. It wasn't just on U.S. versus international. It also looked at value growth and a a few other things. Um, But the U.S.'s victory, and call it a little more, call it 30 years. And by the way, the U.S. was soundly defeated by non-U.S. in the prior 20 years. That was m- probably mostly a Japan effect, um, but I don't think entirely. I, I, I think, I, I, you know, and you can, you can write out, let's just start out. Uh, you can say someone who looked at that, who said, I'm never going to own the U.S. again, was wrong for a long time before they changed their mind. So looking at even really long periods can be deceiving. But if you look at the U.S.'s victory, don't quote me on the actual numbers, but it's very close. About 85 percent of the U.S.'s victory over the last 30 some odd years has come from the U.S. getting more expensive relative to non-U.S. markets. So pick your favorite multiple. And we've looked at tons of them. You can use price to book, price to sales, price to trailing earnings, forecasted earnings, free cash flow. The U.S., at the beginning of this period, sold at a discount, probably because people were depressed about it after a period of underperformance. Again, it's hard to think about 1990 U.S., but it was not an upbeat economic environment. The U.S. now sells at a substantial premium. 85% of its victory in returns has been this repricing. 
15% has come from genuine fundamental outperformance, growing earnings, sales, margins better. The U.S. has functioned somewhat better. But I think many out there would tacitly just assume that 100% of the U.S.'s victory is just the U.S. is awesome and they've executed so well. No, that's been a relatively small fraction of it. Most of it, partly due to them executing better and partly maybe just a sense of safety in the U.S., has been people being increasingly willing to pay a higher and higher relative multiple for all the same fundamentals in the U.S. Now, there, there are basically two possibilities going forward and a third one that I dismiss. The one I dismiss is the U.S. continues to get relatively more expensive. That gap just grows to ad infinitum. No trees grow to the sun. And the U.S. is already quite uh, more expensive. So there are two possibilities. The U.S. expensiveness, its relative expensiveness, was wrong 30 years ago and is right now. It's justified. People moved. It took them a long time, but they've moved to the right level. That is somewhat good news for a U.S. concentrated investor because it means you don't have to give back your outperformance. But it doesn't mean you get it again. It doesn't mean going forward, the U.S. is better. It, uh, repricings to fair are one-time things. The other, and I'm going to guess truth is somewhere in between these two, the other is, is some of this will mean revert. Um, the U.S. being very expensive, um, and that's true, by the way, even if you adjust for industry effects, it's not as extreme. Obviously, the U.S. dominates in the tech industry, but even if you look industry by industry, the U.S. multiples are larger. If some of that mean reverts, it, you know, I'm not predicting disaster for the U.S. by any means, uh, but it could mean that the opposite bet is a little bit better going forward. But I don't think it's even vaguely tenable to say you want to always overweight the U.S. because of the last 30 years. Um, I, and I, I somewhat joke um, when you see papers in the U.S. or, or even st strategy write ups that basically say, why invest internationally? Look how well we've done. Are there papers being written in Japan saying why invest domestically? You should only invest in the U.S.? No. The diversification means, let me give you my favorite quote about diversification. And for, for UK and European audience, I'm a little nervous about this one because it's an American baseball quote. Yogi Berra, who may be known on the continent, um, he may have, I don't know what, he, what of the many quotes attributed to him he actually said. The internet has ruined quotes, as you know, because you always think it was this person and it turns out it wasn't. But one of the things he was supposed to have said was you have to go to other people's funerals. Otherwise, they won't come to yours. And Yogi missed the fact that you're dead already or vice versa. But forgetting forgetting Yogi, international diversification is kind of like that. You have to be humble and go, we don't know who the winner's going to be. Um, there are it, it, last last empirical finding I'll give you. I'm sorry you got me started on one of my bugaboos. It's all another knock on diversification, usually from a U.S. investor who's just happy with the U.S.'s performance. Is why bother? Because even when you need diversification, it doesn't work. Everything crashes at the same time. That is both true and entirely misleading. And we wrote a piece on this in the Financial Analyst Journal um, with the title, International Diversification Works, dot, 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 eventually. And what we showed was that statement is absolutely true about short-term crashes, or to be more technical, has been true. I always want to get my tenses right. Meaning when the world panics, when you have a March of 2020, when you have an October of 87, and August of 98, when Russia defaulted, some go down more than others, but there aren't a lot of safe, developed, big global equity markets. They crash together. If you run the exercise, so if you look at worst cases for a global portfolio, they're fairly similar to individual country worst cases at the short end. But if you take a longer lens and look at worst, say, decades, the worst decade for the global portfolio has been considerably more mild than the worst decade for pretty much every individual country. Because there are decades that are country specific. And the poster child for this will probably always be 1990s Japan. And I don't mean to pick on them, it was just the most extreme 
but it also holds up from many from other countries' perspectives. If your actual worry, uh, if you're only invested in your own country, is that you turn out to be the next decade's 1990s Japan. And diversification really does protect you from that. And I think it is great hubris to sit there and go, we're the country that has succeeded for 30 years. Um, so that cannot happen to us. I don't think it's a high probability, but I, I believe in diversification and I'll defend it to my, uh, uh, to my dying day. Absolutely. And all I'm with you and any, any non-US investor has benefited from it. So, <laughs> so the irony is exactly. lost on one, but, but it's staying with that, uh, dispersion in valuation between the US and the non-US. What do you think causes the pendulum to swing the other way? First, let me be brutally honest. It might not. Uh, if you look at like quality measures, profitability, margins, the US is stronger. Um, and some of this may be justified. Um, prior to the last few years, and, and I don't want to get morbid, but certainly prior to the last week, I might have said people look at the U.S. political and legal system as more stable and safe. I, I think that's probably a harder sell today um, than it than it than it was sadly even a few days ago. Um, but that has been part of the repricing. Um, so some of it could be justified. Again, even if some of it's justified, that just means you don't get it again. Um, so it doesn't mean you want to overweight the U.S. going forward. Um, the second part is let's assume a big chunk of it is unjustified. Let me be brutally honest. We are really bad. And I don't just mean AQR. I mean the collective financial community, certainly including AQR, at finding the precise catalyst for when rationality is reimposed on, on markets. Um, in 99-2000, we lived through the dot-com bubble. This is ancient history to a lot of your listeners, but it was very formative to me because we had just started a new firm. And even though value is not all we do, it tends to dominate at times of valuation bubbles. I wrote another piece called uh, uh, Value is Only a Small Part of What We Do, Except Occasionally When It's Everything We Do. Uh, I kind of I paraphrase the title because I never remember my exact titles. Uh, but I remember uh, that was only about a year and a half. I say only, um, but it felt like 10 years of rational strategies, trying to buy cheap, high quality things with low betas and um, getting just destroyed. And the question we got from everyone was, when's it going to work? And my answer would be, it's going to work extremely big from here. But I cannot tell you it's not going to get worse before it gets better. Catalysts are sometimes clear ex post. But even that, if you tell me why that, I'm, go, I'm, I'm going back 25 years, but if you tell me why the dot-com bubble burst in March of 2000, looking back, I don't think anyone has a super clear reason. The Fed had injected a bunch of money worrying about Y2K, another ancient issue that, it, that probably a lot of people have never even heard of. Um, and they were starting to withdraw that. That might be part of it. Uh, Barron's famously had a cover story about the burn rate at tech and particularly dot-com companies. Uh, meaning they were burning through their cash. And some people point to that as maybe, you know, they couldn't refinance, but they burned through cash for a decade and they were always able to raise new cash at higher multiples. So that's unsatisfying. So I, I think most of the time, investing is about doing all the small things. Um, having a diversified portfolio of things that are more attractive than the things that you're underweight or short and making money more often than not but not making gigantic amounts of money, not losing gigantic amounts of money. I think there are bubbles, and maybe I disagree with Gene Fama to get back to our, uh, our starting point on this, um, uh, that, that there are sometimes some large bubbles. And then, you know, more power to you if you could find the catalyst. But I think life at that point is mainly about keeping an open mind that you might be wrong, you never want to say we've been running this model for 20 years and it works because even if the claim the world has changed and it's different this time is wrong 99 out of 100 times, I would doubt it's wrong 100 out of 100 times. So if you don't have an open mind that you might be wrong, you're doing it wrong. But if you really and truly study it and decide you're right, those few times are not about predicting the catalyst. 
They're about sticking to what you do, like grim death and defending it and being proven right. And that we've done that at least twice. Um, it's not fun, but it's occasionally necessary. And as you look forward for the next two years, we got a re- we've had a repricing of debt, which may be pausing, and who's to know whether 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 it actually surprises people and edges up in a world more like the seventies than the world that most people yeah. predict. But where do you think you are likely to extract more return over the t- next two years, given these quite important dispersions? I'm going to sound like uh, Warren Harding, a U.S. president who ran on a a platform of a return to normalcy after World War I. Um, we still see a larger than normal disparity between what you might call growth versus value. I kind of hate those terms. They're very simplistic. We don't dislike growth. We like cheap things contingent on growth, but we'll go with the public terms for now. Any way you define it, and many others have, have repeated this. Uh, I think we actually, I'll brag, I think we pioneered this analysis defending our process in 1999. We built something called the value spread. Uh, Prior to that, all the academic work, at least, had simply sorted stocks on various measures of value and said, on average, the cheap beat the expensive. But we I I guess we got lucky because no one had looked at it yet. We came along and said, "Okay, but how big's the difference? You know, you can sort all the stocks on your favorite valuation metric. It can be a known one. It could be a proprietary one. You can always find cheap and expensive on your own metric. That's by definition. But sometimes maybe they're all smushed together. I'm getting technically quantitative with phrases like smushed. And sometimes the disparities are very large. And bubbles, a a good working definition of a bubble is a disparity so large you don't think it's possibly justified in any with any reasonable uh, uh, ideas. Um, And right now, we are well off the highs. Uh, By late 2020, that disparity had did something I never expected. If you had asked me after living through the dot-com bubble 25 years ago, are you going to see something more extreme in your career, at least in individual stocks? Again, we trade more than that. We do macro, but in individual stocks, are you going to see a, a mispricing larger than that? I would have said, nah. I Hopefully, I'd be smart enough to go to not say definitely not. No one in our field. My field, your field, our collective field should ever say they're 100% certain because we live in a wacky world where crazy things happen. But I think I would have said almost definitely not. A, it was the most insane thing in 50 years. B, in my career, by definition, I'll still be around and other people will still be around who saw the dot-com bubble. So maybe 100 years from now, it'll happen again. But 20 years later, nah, uh, almost definitely not. And then it did. Um, So I was totally wrong about that one. No one ever asked the question, but had they asked, I would have been totally wrong. Um, That disparity got to what I call, this is a mathematical joke, the 120th percentile. The joke, of course, is there is no 120th percentile. You were just the new 100th percentile. But it got to decently wider, bigger disparities than in the dot-com bubble. I think... It took COVID to really take us there, uh, but that was not all of it. Prior to COVID, we were getting close to dot-com bubble levels in this in this thing we track. COVID sent it to the stratosphere, so I don't want to make that a sole excuse. You know, COVID ate my alpha is a poor is a poor excuse, but it took COVID to send it to extremes. So by the by, kind of the end of 2020, we saw record levels, um, and 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 it was not justified by any fundamentals we looked at. We spent a lot of time saying, "Is there something we're missing?" And then the task is to stick with it. That has done, you know, I'm going to brag and get in trouble, but that has done kind of fabulous since late 2020. Um, Not all measures of value have done fabulous. Um, If you were betting against the Magnificent Seven, you, and call that value versus growth, you didn't enjoy it. Um, We, and it's not unique to us, some other quants do this too, take a very diversified approach. The Magnificent Seven are in there, but at no special weight. And we don't bet a lot on industries or sectors. Uh, We wrote a paper in 95 saying value is pretty coarse way to do that. And that has proven very good in the last few years as we've avoided that. So it has come way back to the mid 80s percentile. That leads me to, in a much more mild way, 
you know, in, in late 2020, I was defending value and saying some people who do this are going to make an awful lot of money. I don't know when it's the right thing to do. That has come way in. I'd still say value uh, as, as a general strategy. And again, not shorting the Magnificent Seven. We don't do concentrated bets. It's still looking somewhat better than average. But this will sound weird, but mid 80th percentile, you might want a little more of that bet. And I do. In my personal portfolio, I still have more of that bet. But not to the same degree. The 120th percentile is a this can't stand. The 85th percentile can last for 20 years. It, it, it doesn't have the same gravitational pull. So very long-winded way of saying that the trade of the last four years for us of being overweight value is still there, but at a fairly uh, much more mild level. Um, we have, a, you know, I end up talking about value and momentum so much when we talk about these histories. I, I always feel bad because we didn't stop there. Um, our process is far richer and far deeper, um, adding new factors over time, new themes, getting very into uh, more systematic machine learning type driven investing in the last five to 10 years, uh, new data sources that were not available, alternative data sources. Um, I do think, and these are famous last words, uh, there could be giant events to come, but I, 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 I think these bubbles are not what I worry about in the next two years. I think we grind it out and make maybe are historically normal or maybe a little better because of that value spread than normal returns in a relatively uncorrelated way. And I'll be very happy. I, I don't want to die on those hills. Sometimes I just have to. Great. Cliff, I want to switch to private assets. I sit on a couple of investment committees. They have uh, private assets in there, be it private equity, private debt. That's quite normal these days. You have coined the phrase, or at least it is associated with you, of volatility laundering. And it is remarkable for those of us who are old time public market investors that the sort of the almost the free lunch that appears as these private assets are marked infrequently and therefore with lower volatility seem to be the investor's dream. Certainly the actuarials all love to. Yeah. Look back in the review mirror and assign them higher weightings than might be the case. Just uh, how should we mark PE? I got to be careful here. I, I come off as too negative sometimes. Um, let's step back for a second. You can think of any investment as expected return over risk. How to define risk is an open issue. Volatility is a simplistic way to do it. And my phrase, volatility laundering, which is one of the few phrases attributed to me that I actually didn't steal, um, that I did come up with. Most of my anything, most of my quotes, I am paraphrasing someone smarter than me. Um, but return over risk, any investor of any kind, they may define risk differently, but that's that's how they should be thinking of the world. I do not have a particular bone to pick. I have a few concerns going forward, but I don't have a particular bone to pick with private investing about the return part. There is a great fight. There are some academics who will write papers saying the returns have not been as good as they look. Um, there are 19 levels of fees. Their IRRs, not returns. They, they sometimes pay you in kind. And what do you actually get for this? I'm not in that fight. I, I truly don't know. It's not something I spend a ton of time on. And it seems like both sides have some, some merit to them. The risk side. I have been driven somewhat crazy by what you described by the idea that effectively these assets are riskless. You see firms draw efficient frontiers uh, where you put the risk on the x-axis and the expected return on the y-axis, and they often have privates way to the left of, of public markets. You don't get less risky in reality by refusing to acknowledge changes in price. So you ask me how we should mark privates. I'm going to broaden the question and go, there are two ways, two extremes. You could do things in between, but two extremes you can price any set of assets at. You can price it at what you could sell it at today. And to be fair to privates, I would never use a panic sell it all in a day for a private portfolio. In an orderly sale, what you could sell it at today, or you could sell it at what you think it's worth, or you could market, excuse me, at what you think it's worth. Now, let me be even more clear. Both private assets and managers like us who trade liquid public assets 
are absolutely capable of doing either way. Privates, they do a little moving with the market, but they're largely marking it at where they think it's worth. One of the great reposts to me, if I pronounced that right, one of the great responses to me um, from private managers are public markets are crazy. That is volatility, but our marks are more accurate. What they're saying, which I have a lot of sympathy for, because again, I believe markets aren't perfect and that there are bubbles, is that they are right. When markets fall 20%, why should we mark it down 20%? The businesses are still worth more. That's a fairly aggressive position. That says markets, uh, you know, I said they're not perfect, but that says they're, they're totally wrong. But my more general point is private managers are absolutely capable of marking things at where they think it's worth or at where they think they could sell it today. People make it sound like this is some, oh, we don't know where we could sell it. These guys, they know more about individual businesses than I can dream of. They're brilliant. They chose to buy these businesses based on a valuation model that is often based off the public markets and what discount they think they're getting. They could absolutely tell you in an orderly sale what we think it would be down today if the markets fell 20%. And normally, for a lot of them, that would be somewhat more than the markets because they're somewhat mildly levered. Um, on the other hand, we are completely capable of telling you what we think the portfolio is worth. In March of 2020, when a 20 plus percent vol portfolio was down in the 30s for us, which by the way, was just about a two standard deviation event, horrible way to start a business, but not a statistical off the charts event, but not fun when the 18 of your first 19 months are, are, are down that. We were absolutely capable of telling people we think markets are nuts, and when they return to normal, we're going to be up, not just make the money back, but up 30%. Turned out to be more than that. Why one group gets to mark things one way and another group gets to mark them another when we're both capable of doing both is beyond me. To be very blunt, I think we've gotten a giant agency problem where everyone knows that the marks are kind of bull blank. That's not going to be my favorite. Uh, the fa my, my compliance and my my marketing area is not going to be thrilled with that phrase, but it's not quite as 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 pithy as volatility laundering. Um, but there's an agency problem. If you're on an investment committee, it's a lot easier to report to someone who maybe isn't following the portfolio as closely, steady as she goes. And it's a quirk of the legal system and conventions in our marking that they get to do it one way. And it has consequences. Sometimes people come back to me and go, so what's the problem? You just stick with the investments. I go, well, there are two potential consequences. One, I, I pray this doesn't happen because there's a lot of collateral damage in a devastating decade. But if you have a really bad decade for equities, you can't hide anymore. Even the privates will be there. And if you assumed they were a 4% volatility portfolio and a 0.3 beta, when they're actually a 22% vol 1.3 beta, you are going to have a very rude awakening exactly when it matters most. Second, if you recall, I made a little parenthetical comment saying I don't want to fight about the returns, but I have some concerns going forward. Go back to, say, the 1980s and famously David Swenson at Yale. Was, was the major pioneer of introducing these assets into endowment portfolios. It is highly likely that he was a genius and realized you got a very large premium for being willing to accept this illiquidity and opac opacity. That means that illiquidity and opacity was a bug. And in a rational investing world, and the world's not always rational, but in a rational investing world, you get paid extra if you're willing to be the one to take the bug. And I think that was the truth. That was like, you know, when, when, when David was doing that, he was probably uh, being be, buying things that were priced at relatively huge discounts to public markets for his willingness to engage. If you believe my story, and it's, you, have to, you don't have to believe me, that this bug has become a feature that many willingly close their eyes because it makes life easier for them. Well, a feature is something you pay for, not something you get paid for. 
And it's not portending disaster for privates at all, but it does say that edge might be much smaller, gone, or even the wrong sign going forward. If this makes life easier, you should be willing to accept a lower return than the true beta and risk entail. Um, and this is an opportunity I occasionally have. I live in Greenwich, Connecticut. So I say these things and I'm surrounded by private managers. Um, and, and I'm friends with a bunch of them, but some of them give me dirty looks, I have to tell you. But if you get them a little tipsy, they'll tell you and, and, and that they that what they buy, the multiples are much closer to public markets than they were at, at X early point in their career. So I do think, and this applies to anything, it applies to AQR, any long-term successful strategy has a little bit of the uh, uh, root of its own problems going forward. And they are the most long-term successful strategy you can imagine. Not only do they have this opacity, but they had it during a 30, 40 year bull equity market where in even counting the backup in interest rates, um, interest rates have largely just done this. So it was a pretty good 40 years to run a levered equity portfolio. And then if you throw in, we look much calmer and safer than we are. It's not a wonder. It is a gigantic business. But I think it is danger, quite dangerous to assume that they're anywhere like some of the risk estimates people use. There are some people who are very responsible who will tell you, no, we're investing in privates, but we assume they're 1.3 times riskier and more power to them. I'm not criticizing that. But then you do get, um, I, I, I've become, because I've complained about this publicly uh, and been a gadfly to the industry, I am the one who gets copied whenever someone's annoyed about something in the private world. Like on Twitter, someone will always tag me. And, and sometimes they succeed. Sometimes I rise above it. Um, ah, most of the time they succeed. I got sent a private credit, like a one-page tear sheet that had at the bottom sharp ratio, realized sharp ratio over X, you know, pretty, I forget, five years, whatever, 10.0. We all have heard of, unfortunately, he's just passed on Jim Simons at Renaissance and the Medallion Fund. Not everything Renaissance does, but a lot of the stuff they do is just good quant stuff, not better than what people like we do. But the Medallion Fund is magic. They have made an insane amount of money with very low risk in liquid securities for a really long time. And I bow before them. Jim Simons never had a 10.0 sharp ratio. I don't know the exact number, uh, but if I had a guess, two, three, maybe. Um, very am amazing numbers. The stock market's a 0.4 sharp ratio. 10.0. Even two or three might be an exaggeration. 10.0 is insane. And of course, there's the requisite disclaimers in the deep, small print. But they're happy with this number. They're proud of this number. And that's the kind of thing that will send a person like me. Steam will come out of my ears. Um, and private credit in particular. Private credit probably has a better story than private equity right now. Because there is a replacement of banks who used to be the intermediaries here. So the idea that there should be a large new private credit industry, I think, is real. But uh, one of my colleagues, Pete Hecht, uh, and others have done this work. If you actually look at the returns on the average, and it's hard to get the data, but the best you can do, average private credit manager, it looks a lot like some form of high yield investing. It doesn't look like magic. It's the volatility yeah. laundering that looks like magic. And that whole industry has not been around through a credit crisis. Um, so it, it, maybe they'll be better than the, than the old school debt used to be because they're great managers. Um, maybe the extra fees they charge will make it worse. But yeah, I do think there are some super talented managers and none of this is about alpha. If you find a private equity or private credit manager, you think it's 5% better than the average? Always do that. Whatever I'm saying is trumped by if you find someone you think is incredibly skilled. The cynic in me will say, be really, you know, I, I don't think you run into those managers every day, uh, but it's not about that. Uh, but the general investment uh, uh, in these things, I think, is largely being sold on the ability to report what I think are fake numbers. Um, and that has dangers and consequences.
Well, that's very clearly expressed. I'm going to move to some general closing questions. You just hinted at one of them. You're pretty active on Twitter. Do you <laughs> need the oxygen? Do you need that oxygen of publicity? Uh, I'll say a few things. One, I shouldn't be. Um, I, I've not blown myself up yet, but Twitter is always a vehicle where you could say something you think is <laughs> is is fine, but is uncharitably interpreted, and 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 life's over. I get kind of sucked in because uh, they call themselves FinTwit uh, for financial Twitter. There are great people on there having great conversations. Um, so that's what keeps bringing me back. And then I've gotten better about this. In my early days of Twitter, and I took about a one-year break from Twitter. I've, I've, half the people on Twitter have at one point taken a Twitter vacation and succumbed and come back. Um, I was worse. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I still slip. But I was worse at responding to trolls when I started. Um, you know, I had this view that if someone said something terrible about me that I thought was dramatically untrue, that if I didn't respond, everyone on earth would read it and believe it, which I no longer think is the case. I think most people know to roll their eyes at, at, at Twitter things. Uh, but I absolutely love the FinTwit community. I have great conversations. Uh, I think I have a weird dual reputation on Twitter, and I think there are people who, a lot of people who back me up in the FinTwit community. I think I'm super nice if someone comes with a polite question, even if it's very naive, even if I, I think it's a newbie question, even if it's not a newbie question and they're taking the other side from me. I have thin skin. The other problem with Twitter is if you are a person who thinks in any way, falsely or truly, that you are quick-witted and funny, and I certainly think I am, I'm not sure a lot would agree, it is almost irresistible. Because that dopamine hit of saying something funny and having it be validated by others, it's, it's you get to be an amateur comedian um, without having to put in the work in those dive bars. Um, so I probably shouldn't do it. I think I've gotten better. Probably the worst thing I've done, which I should admit to you, is I accidentally waded into the meme stock wars. Um, this was like two Junes ago or one June ago. I, I, I can't remember years anymore. I remember two periods well, the last two weeks and high school. Everything else is kind of a mush. Uh, but I, I, I was going on CNBC. Uh, and we almost we, we don't do TV too often. Um, partly, that's just uh, we have a very institutional clientele, and that's not where we think they, they, uh, they get there opinions. We think they'd much rather listen to an erudite podcast uh, from the, than, than, than TV. Uh, but we had this really terrible couple of years and then a huge comeback. So my team that generally doesn't encourage this said, we think it's time to go on TV and, and tell people that we were right and we're back. Um, and long term, you've, you've, you're back to have doing great with us. So I, I go on there and I'm having the pre-call. You do a little pre-call uh, you don't script it by any means, uh, but you don't want to get on there and find that the anchor is asking you things absolutely unrelated to stuff you know about. So they kind of insist I name a few individual stocks, something, Simon, I appreciate you not doing. And I keep saying that's a terrible question for a quant. We, I, I'm not going to be precise, but we might have 750 longs and 750 shorts around the world diversified by country and industry. Um, if I know about an individual stock, it's often bad news. It's something happened so outside the realm of reality that it actually cost us 25 basis points, which is more than one individual stock should, should cost us at a time. So I keep saying this. They keep saying everyone in this segment gives individual names. You really have to. So I make them a deal. All right, you got to give me a full one minute to explain why this might be fun and help you grasp what we do, but it's not what we do. I could be terribly wrong about these three and we could have a great year. I could be terribly right, wonderfully right, and we could have a terrible year. I asked my team to give me some examples because I, I usually don't know the individual stocks, to be brutally honest. If I Again, if I know them, it's probably something crazy has happened. 
one I, and I give them specific instructions. Give me stocks that are bad on most of our factors. That's not necessarily the stocks we hate the most because it's not about magnitude. There may be stocks horrifically bad on half and mediocre on half, but that's a complicated story for TV. So I wanted to be able to say this stock is expensive and unprofitable and high beta and and uh, insiders are selling it uh, and shorts don't like it. Um, and you pick all your favorite measures. It's easier if it fits. And one of the ones they gave me was uh, AMC, the movie company. I knew they were a meme stock. I knew I certainly followed the meme stock phenomenon. It didn't touch us as quants because we don't have concentrated positions. I had no idea what a fever swamp of crazy that place was. So I just I I say we're short and then in a very obnoxious way and I take full blame for this. My last line is, but we're only short 12 basis points of the portfolio. So the crazies can't even hurt us. It turns out, Simon, I know you'll be shocked by this. People do not enjoy being called crazy. This was rude of me. I was trying to be funny. And my actual point was you guys should not be worried about us because we as quants are so cowardly. That it's a very weakly held position. You guys could actually turn out to be right. It could be bad on everything, and you could turn out to be right. So my delivery was very obnoxious, but my message was meant to be conciliatory. It was pointed out to me afterwards, and this will sound elitist, but it didn't occur to me, that a lot of the, the people in this world might not know what a basis point was. So my point was just lost on them, and I was just the jerk telling them they're crazy. And then they attacked me on Twitter. And then I fought back. So I spent about two months with a lot of people in my firm saying, can't you just stop responding to these people? Because they, they say truly horrible things with anonymous handles. And that was the dark period for me of Twitter, where I spent about two months responding to these people. It still comes up occasionally, and I have gotten much better. I have my, my 200-day chip, as Alcoholics Anonymous would call it. Uh, I don't think I've done that in a while. But that is my full Twitter story you've gotten out of me now. Thank you. Well, two final questions, Cliff. You've been a very generous donor. You're known in the world of philanthropy. We've discussed this with previous guests who have been you know, very generous. How do you judge a successful outcome? Oh, that, that, A, that's so hard. Um, it's so hard um, because it's not just the outcome. It's, it's, it's was this the best place? For the money. Yeah. Even if it's obviously a good outcome, one of my favorite charities um, I, I've, I've supported, I've been on the board at times, um, is a local Greenwich uh, charity uh, uh, started by uh, David and Cynthia Kim. Uh, uh, David is a West Point former Army Ranger. Um, and it, it was it's called Children of Fallen Patriots. And what they do is for servicemen who have died in the line of duty, including training accidents and things. They'll send their kids to college. This is the outlier where I am certain this is a very good thing. I raise that as the counterexample. In many other cases, you have to agonize and keep reevaluating. I use some of the very basic tools, like famously Charity Navigator is a tool everyone in the world. That's largely financial. Um, is most of the money getting to the, um, you know, there are charities, and, 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 and I can't think of any off the top of my head, thankfully where you realize the salaries being paid out are 80% of the donations coming in. So that's kind of table stakes. That's you know minimum is you want to avoid that. Um, then some things like Children of Fall and Patriots are incredibly obvious. And then others like giving to institutions of higher education. Incredibly non-obvious that that's the best use of money in the world. And I've backed away from a fair of that. There's still some schools I support um, but, it, you know, famously, um, I, I got in a little bit of a fight with the University of Pennsylvania over some of their actions on, on Israel and Hamas, and I, I moved away from that. But even before that, whether higher education, where these places have $40, 50000000000 billion endowments in some place, cases, whether they're an actual good use of a charitable dollar. Um, I could tell you a story where they are, where this is very multi-generational, and, and our best people get educated there. And and I could tell you a story where they're really not. So I am 
uh, filibustering the question, as we, we would say in the U.S., because I don't have a firm answer. My wife and I spend a lot of time on it. We care about it. Uh, I'll tell you, we do not. The value of diversification is not the same in charity. A good one versus a bad one don't offset each other. We're more willing to be concentrated. We're not quants when it comes to charity. We're not trying to build the highest sharp ratio charity portfolio. Um, we have someone who works with us on it, um, uh, who's constantly trying to reevaluate. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job. And it's one of my great joys. That uh, sounds really uh, self-aggrandizing and highfalutin. Uh, but it, it's one of my great joys. And also when you give to something that after the case, you think that was really ineffective, you feel really stupid. And it's, it, it's a great sadness. So it's a responsibility that comes with getting lucky in life. Um, I think we've embraced it, uh, but we, sorry, we have no magic answer. A lot of sweat equity. Well, my final question is, who's the one person in this world you haven't met who you'd like to sit down and have dinner with? Oh, I'm going to get yelled at by everyone. Uh, but I have not <laughs> met Elon Musk. And love him or hate him. He's a genius and he's fascinating. And again, love him or hate him. There have been times I've radically disagreed and times I've loved what he said. You do, uh, with some self-serving bias that we all have, you get a highly unfiltered version. And as someone who considers themselves sometimes too unfiltered, I do respect non-corporate speak. Corporate speak make me, makes me roll my eyes. Um, so... Uh, if if Elon ever auctions off one of those lunches, Warren Buffett, I'd love to have lunch with Warren Buffett, too. I've not met him either. I'm not saying there aren't others. Um, but if Elon ever auctions off one of those lunches, um, I, I may if, if, if Steve Cohen wants it, I'll be outbid. Ken Griffin wants it, I'll be outbid. But if those guys don't want it, I may be, I may be the high bidder uh, on that lunch. And now half, half your audience hates me now. And uh, I doubt it very much. Um, I summarize at the end of these interviews, I'll just try and pick three, which is when we talk about the, the outperformance of the US, your expression, which must resonate, is no trees grow to the sun. And the perspective of being long term means different things to different people. But these may be glacial, but we've, most of us who've been doing this for a long time have seen how cycles absolutely play out. That's number one. Number two, um, is that uh, when you, talked about charity just then, you made an interesting point, which is concentration trumps diversity. Um, and number three, when we think about private markets and those who are involved with it, you really do need to consider very carefully exactly what you're looking at when you chuck it against a listed equity and you assign sort of, you know, similar measures to try and understand the riskiness. And maybe that isn't yet still being digested enough by investment entities around the world. Despite my Herculean efforts, yes. <laughs> you summed it, those, it, those were uh, probably the three top takeaways to me too. Well, Cliff, thank you. It's been great to visit you uh, digitally. Hopefully we'll do it in person in due course, but thank you for coming on the Money Miss podcast. Today. Oh, this was fun. Um, uh, I'll tell you, one of my favorite conversations I've had in a while, and I appreciate being invited. All content on the Money Maze podcast is for your general information and use only, and is not intended to address your particular requirements. In particular, the content does not constitute any form of advice, recommendation, representation, endorsement, or arrangement, and is not intended to be relied upon by users in making any specific investment or other decisions. Guests and presenters may have positions in any of the investments discussed.